So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the Boston Society of Architects Matter and Opinion Existing Buildings. Um, it's a seven session series on climate action and building the will. We have uh, the will to reuse existing buildings. Uh, we have uh, three sessions remaining, including this one. And uh, next slide. And I'm Jean Caroon. I'm a principal at Goody Clancy, a Boston architecture planning and preservation firm. And I'm thrilled to be moderating our fourth session uh, with some of my favorite people ever in terms of builders and architects. And I see from our people who've already signed in that we have some very talented people who are listening. So I hope we'll have a robust conversation uh, at the end of the presentation. We'll be focusing, as we've said, on, ex on uh, on residential. Today it will be about housing, about residential design. For the remaining two sessions, we will look into multifamily housing and higher education facilities. We hope you'll be able to join us uh, for those two sessions as well. Before we go any further, of course, this wouldn't happen without our sponsors, and we very much appreciate Spalding Brick company um, making this session, making all the sessions possible. And I'd like to thank all our many partners, uh, AIA Central Massachusetts, who are also hosting the New England uh, Design Awards this year, AIA Connecticut, AIA Rhode Island, AIA Vermont, Western Massachusetts, and the Boston Preservation Alliance, Built Environment Plus, and um, the Boston chapter of the International Facility Management Association. We are recording these sessions and uh, by joining you're acknowledging that uh, and uh, your, your, your attendance includes your consent uh, to that. We will share the session uh, later this week for you to access on architects.org and, uh, and we'll notify you by email as well. Uh, today's live session uh, brings with it the benefit of continuing education credits for those of us who need them for our architecture license. But once this is, is released, uh, you can share with anyone and we welcome people gathering this information and expanding the circle of people who hear and talk about these issues. If you would like to receive continuing, oh, sorry, uh, Caitlin, I was just going to say, uh, if you want to receive the continuing education credit, uh, Caitlin will, will post the link in the chat for you to fill in. Uh, and I should say from experience, it will go in very quickly, thanks to her good work on this. So this, this session and the series aim to uh, to build the will around existing buildings uh, among all constituents by investigating the hurdles to and the benefits of existing building work. Uh, that's what we hope to accomplish. And we also want to underscore as owners, architects, builders, and advocates, we wanna embrace existing buildings for all the many things that they can contribute, uh, but especially uh, as, as climate solutions. The more we can help people understand that reusing what already exists is the best thing we can do for the environment, the more likely we are to see policies and economics and advocacy that make it easier to reuse existing buildings. So today we'll uh, speak about uh, two local residences with their owners and the designers about the challenges of bringing 20th century buildings up to the 21st century standards while maintaining them as family homes. Um, the following presentations on each of the projects will, and after the presentations on each of the projects will open up for discussion and Q&A. If you have questions as you're listening to the presentations, please post them uh, to the chat uh, and the, we'll, we'll, we'll draw from that. And occasionally we can just answer some of the questions with resources in the chat or both. So first we'll hear from Rachel White, who is the CEO at Big Meister Design Build and Bill Harper, who is one of the designers at Big Meister Design Build, with the homeowner, Kathy Claire Hayes, who was their client for the project. And then we will hear from uh, Jonathan Cantor, 
the founder and principal of Sage Builders, and Frank Dill, uh, the founder and principal at Frank Dill Architects with the homeowners Woody Swan and Marjorie Woodwell. We particularly appreciate the homeowners coming to join our session. Uh, this is so very kind of you to share your experiences and be part of this topic. Obviously, none of us could work if you didn't um, employ us. So thank you. So with that, uh, let's begin. Thank you, Jean, for that introduction. Thank you um, to the BSA for um, hosting this important series and for including a session on um, small residential as part of this series and for inviting Big Meister as well as Sage uh, to participate. Um, we're, we're all really glad to be here, so thank you. Um, for those of you who are here today who don't know Big Meister, uh, we are a nearly 40 year old design build residential remodeling firm based in Newton. Um, our mission is to preserve and adapt existing homes to meet 21st century environmental and social needs. Um, we do not do new construction except for the occasional addition to an existing home. We, we only work on existing homes. Um, next slide, please, Bill. The project that we're going to be sharing with you today that Bill did the design work for uh, and Kathy, um, Kathy and Chris, her, her husband, our wonderful clients are here to speak about as well. In many ways, this project is typical for us. Um, it exemplifies the type of work that we love to do, which is to transform an inefficient and dated, but otherwise solidly built and beloved home into one that is functional, that's comfortable, efficient, and low emitting, and will also continue to serve its occupants well for decades to come. Um, on the other hand, there were some unique aspects of this house and of this project that made it stand out um, from some of our other work and also made it especially meaningful to us. The first aspect uh, was that before Kathy and Kathy's husband Chris hired us, relatively little had been done to this house since it was built in 1930 um, as a three bedroom, one and a quarter. Um, you'll see in a moment why we call it a one and a quarter bath rather than a one and a half bath house. It had never substantially been updated. No permits had been pulled since 1930. So it's, it was relatively untouched, mostly at in, insulated. You'll see later on images of the uh, pre-project um, systems and they were using uh, window air conditioning. So most, we, we work on homes that are this old and certainly much older, although it's unusual for us to work on a house that it had so little done to it um, since it had been built. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Kathy, who will talk um, about another unique aspect of the house, which is her family's um, relationship to it and long history with it. Thanks, Rachel. So um, this is my husband, Chris, um, and then our son, Declan, is in the middle, and I'm standing to the right um, in front of the house. And then the picture on the left is Chris with his grandfather, who we call Pop. Um, celebrating one of his birthdays. So this is the house that Chris's mom grew up in. Um, and she actually attended the Boston Public School down the street, which my children also got to attend the same school. Um, and so Chris grew up coming weekends to the house and um, having Sunday dinners with his grandparents and, um, you know, had a very uh, close relationship with Pop. So when Pop died um, in 1992, we moved into the house that August. And it became pretty um, clear to me, uh, his attachment to the house, but also the fact that Pop had been uh, a Boston Public School teacher and then a Boston Public School principal. And he would go in on the weekends to the wood shop and um, do certain things. He built a lot of the furniture that's in the house. He built the china cabinet and did all the kind of um, trim around the house. So Chris was very attached to not making major changes. Um, for a while. I wasn't sure he would ever want to change it. Um, but I set out to, um, to find a group that actually would help us renovate the house to make the flow better and to kind of bring it to, um, you know, uh, more current living conditions. Um, it didn't make, I didn't want to go outside the footprint because we were becoming empty nesters, the kids were going to college, and it felt like the house had space, it just wasn't organized very well. And I also didn't want to deal with um, the Boston zoning 
um, commission in terms of having to go for variances or other things like that in terms of additions. Um, so this was the house as we moved in and lived with it for many years. We've been in the house about 28 years now. And um, the, as you can see here, these are pictures of the kitchen. The kitchen wasn't functional. Um, this is a picture of our, what we joke is the quarter bath. It was barely enough for a person to be in it. Um, and we quickly realized after living with two teenagers that we really needed a, another bathroom in the house. Um, the 20 minute showers, you know, um, had an, became an issue with us. The other issue for, for us was the, um, that we had a beautiful backyard, but it was really hard to access in terms of just kind of going down the stairs. We just didn't use it that much. There wasn't kind of space to, um, to really uh, be outside, um, even though we had this large um, room. So I was interested in adding a deck. And we actually came to the project not intending to necessarily do a big major house renovation, but we came to, I, I contacted Big Investor to see if I could get a home office um, created in the house. Um, we have a freestanding garage and my thought was maybe there. We also have a basement entrance out of the back um, that I was thinking that that would happen. And after a site visit with Big Meister became very obvious for a lot of reasons that those wouldn't be necessarily cost effective. So we asked Big Meister to kind of look at the whole project, look at the whole house, understanding that um, we would probably be here for a number of years and um, what we needed to do to kind of bring it into this century in terms of living and uh, heating and um, that kind of thing. When we moved into the house, um, there, there's the china cabinet you can see in the corner that Chris's grandfather built. And the other problem was the living room had this big long um, length of the house. Um, it had a very drafty fireplace and it just wasn't functional. We just ended up putting stuff, you know, at both ends um, and, I spent most of my winters upstairs because it was too cold to be in the living room. So um, with that, I'm trying to think if there's something else. Um, we wanted more light and, fl I wanted more light in the house. It felt kind of dark um, and uh, flow so that, you know, you would be able to kind of walk from the living room or the, the room into the kitchen um, and have more ability to kind of um, move throughout the house. It felt very sectioned off. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to turn it over to, or Bill. I guess it's Bill's turn. Yeah. So, um, so it uh, as as you can see the 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 before. I mean, it's a, a fairly conventional uh, colonial floor plan. It was actually kind of nice. There was were a few tweaks uh, that Chris's grandfather had built in, which you know, sort of a wider than normal hallway. The ceilings were eight feet instead of the seven foot six that was more conventional to the neighborhood. Um, but I mean, things with the colonial, it's just not really, it doesn't make sense for modern living. You have the sort of a dead end living room taking up a great deal more space, um, of the floor plan than, than deserved at this point. But, but also it, it was very striking, uh, coming to the project because, um, it's, it's, you know, they, they sort of moved in and, <clears throat> and layered their own lives over the history of, of the family history of the house. Uh, the the grand piano, for example, uh, was not not being played by anyone, but it was the family grand piano, so it was it was still there. Um, you know, different things like the the history of the house, like the linoleum tile floor. Uh, you know, Chris knew the specific reason why it was put in, and he shared that with me. Um, you know, just trying to to get them comfortable. Kathy was very comfortable with the notion of. of great change it was it was really uh helping chris um sort of make peace with with transforming the house into what what they wanted it to be um some of the strategies that we enacted were you know also uh benefited from kathy and chris knowing the house so well this is one of the benefits of of living of of working with clients who have lived in the house as opposed to you know, buying renovating a place they haven't moved into yet. They they knew that they wanted the direct connection to the north, uh, to their backyard. Um, and so here you can see uh, <clears throat> this is a view of of the kitchen from the dining room. Uh, we matched widened widened the opening, matching uh, the existing arches that are on either side of the hallway. Um, and uh, and here's the, the kitchen itself. Um, the sink is largely uh, in the same spot as it was. Um, 
where the refrigerator moved that actually they sacrificed a window that effectively would have been into the, the looked into the back the neighbor's backyard so that wasn't a, a tough loss in the name of uh, a more functional kitchen um and then uh we have the the full-size bath um you know there there's a lot of benefits to having a sort of a, an age in place friendly uh bathroom on the first floor um some interesting working with exist existing constraints uh, i probably wouldn't have proposed a, a new uh window behind a, a sink but that was the existing location and um we obviously benefit from having a natural light on from both sides uh, of the room in in the bathroom it's a very bright space um, and then this here is um the shot of the living room and and this was part of the benefit of of having a homeowner who appreciated uh that you know fireplaces while they have um there's a romantic appeal to them and uh stubborn um uh, spot on a realtor's checklist of what makes a home valuable. Um, uh, having a homeowner who appreciated that uh, fireplace is essentially obsolete technology that runs counter to our home insulation and air sealing strategies. Uh, we were able to just seal that up in place. Um, and it, the way it benefited the space planning, uh, we have a much greater um, traffic pattern going all the way around. Uh, a staircase um, sort of in front of the television. Uh, it really uh, opened up opened up the, the possibilities of that room to a much greater degree. So, uh, and then as as Kathy said, the 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 deck. Um, I mean, it the, it really is a, a wonderful backyard. Um, but the the change in height it was almost a a, a walkout basement. Uh, but um, but but it was such a distance from that that single landing down down to the backyard uh, that this is really transformed into uh, a, 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 you know an, an additional room on the first floor uh, effectively. So, and I think I'll pass this to Rachel now. In that picture, there's Rachel and Kathy. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, the energy measures, the improvements that were made to the house um, as part of this project. Uh, this um, slide gives you some sense of the um, existing conditions of the mechanicals as well as of the um, the envelope. I'm not sure what year that boiler uh, and water heater were installed, but um, they the water heater in particular was so old that our plumber, who's um, been doing this work for decades, actually took a photo of it. Um, which was which was a first for me. Um, the house, as I we said at the beginning, was virtually uninsulated except for some loose insulation along uh, the attic floor, um, and and they were using um, window units for for air conditioning. So, what did we do to improve it? First, we did what I call, on the envelope, we did what I like to call a shallow retrofit, whereas a deep energy retrofit adds um, exterior insulation or outsulation um, outboard of roof and wall sheathing. Um, I think of a shallow retrofit as retrofitting within the cavities. So we added um, two inches of closed cell foam along the basement walls. Um, and you'll recall that because of the, the, the grade change that uh, about a third of those basement walls are actually above grade. Um, we installed dense pack cellulose. Um, we did that from the outside and all of the uh, frame wall cavities. And then um, the, the image here is showing the, the treatment we did to, um, to the roof. Uh, we put the um, thermal and air barrier um, at the roof plane in order to um, uh, use the attic space, both for storage, of which you saw in the previous slide, there was a lot of need for, as well as um, for um, the uh, ducted uh, air handler um, for mini split to serve the second floor. Uh, we decided on this particular insulation strategy of three inches of closed cell foam for condensation control, followed by seven inches of cellulose and built down rafters. Uh, in order to minimize the embodied carbon impact. Um, and the, um, the, the calculations we did, the number crunching we did showed that that, that approach 
um, was a, a carbon neutral um, strategy, assuming that we could count um, the storage potential of the cellulose. On the mechanical side, I already mentioned a ducted air handler in the attic to serve the second floor. There's another ducted uh, air handler uh, in the basement that serves the first floor. Very simple system, works really well um, for this, um, this style of house. We also have a heat pump water heater switch to um, induction for cooking. The one remaining gas appliance in the house is the, um, the existing gas dryer. The impact on site energy use and operating emissions um, was, as you can see from this slide, huge. So huge, in fact, um, that I won't really believe it until I've triple and quadruple checked the data. Um, and had somebody else's eyes besides mine look at it. This is weather normalized um, savings, by the way, because I know Jonathan Cantor would ask me that question if I didn't mention it. Um, an 80% reduction in energy use um, is not uncommon, I would say, uh, for a deep energy retrofit, but for a shallow retrofit like this, where we're not adding insulation to the outside of the sheathing, um, I haven't seen that before. Um, given the age of the existing equipment and the fact that the house was almost completely uninsulated or very lightly insulated only in the attic, I would have, if you'd asked me to guess before the project, I would have guessed maybe 50, 60% savings, um, but I wouldn't have guessed 80%, which is why we need to triple check. Um, this last little stat on the table, I just wanted to show, we do before and after blower door tests on all of our projects. Uh, and you can see we um, made um, pretty significant uh, gains there, reducing air leakage by 60%. And I think, I think that's our last slide. Is that right, Bill? All right, so that's it for the Big Meister team and we will um, turn it over to Sage. All right, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. All right. So um, my name is Jonathan Cantor. I'm the principal at Sage Builders uh, in Newton. Uh, we specialize in the design and building of um, homes, mostly renovations. Um, we've done a few um, new construction projects and uh, including a developer, acting as a developer. But generally we are very similar to Big Meister and we're um, focused on existing buildings. We do add on sometimes or add up as is the case here. Um, but uh, we, we try to reuse and preserve the existing as much as possible. Um, but of course we specialize in high performance buildings. So that's always part of the equation. Um, I guess I just uh, advance it here. So we're gonna start our, our presentation um, with the homeowners, Marjorie and Woody, who are gonna talk to you about their house uh, in Arlington and why they decided um, to uh, expand, expand it and reuse it as opposed to tear it down and start new. And then Frank uh, Dill, the architect on the project who collaborated with us, um, will talk to you a little bit more about design issues. And I'll finish up um, at the end with um, a review of the construction process. Um, so Woody and Marjorie, why don't you take it away and I'll advance the slides on your, on your say. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. Oh, you know so, I'm Marjorie Woodwell, and this is my husband, Woody Swan. Um, the picture is our house, which was built in 1939. It was a small one and a half story cape with two small bedrooms upstairs, one bath downstairs, and a one car garage underneath the living room. We bought it in 2001. Next slide. Although the house was solidly built, it had some design elements that did not work well for us. It had a very awkward and outdated kitchen. The upstairs closets were difficult to use because they were set into the knee walls. There was no upstairs bathroom where the bedrooms were. The house was poorly insulated, drafty, hard to heat, 
at extremely uncomfortable in both summer and winter. In summer, the temperature in the upstairs bedrooms frequently exceeded 100 degrees. Next slide. After living in the house for many years, we began to think seriously about whether we wanted to stay in Arlington and do some work on our house or move out of town and build a net zero house somewhere else. After much consideration, we decided we didn't want to move. We like Arlington. It has good shopping, restaurants, and public transportation, all within easy walking distance. It's extremely walkable. It's close to family and recreation. It has access to good medical care and a major airport. We love our neighborhood and our neighbors. We decided we wanted to age in place in our existing neighborhood. Having decided to stay, the question became whether to renovate our existing house to make it much more livable and energy efficient or tear it down and build a new net zero house in its place. Although we did briefly consider tearing down the house and starting over from scratch, being the people we are, we really didn't want to throw away a perfectly good house <coughs> and all of its embodied carbon. And as our architect Frank Dill will explain later in this presentation, we have a non-conforming lot that drastically restricted what we would be able to do if we tore down the entire house. So we decided to renovate our existing house and make it as close to net zero as we could. Next slide. The goals for our renovation project incorporated our environmental and lifestyle values, and they included achieving a high level of energy efficiency, preferably net zero, allowing us to reduce our use of fossil fuels, thereby helping to address the global climate crisis. We also wanted to update and improve the layout of the house, especially the awkward layout of the kitchen and the upstairs floor plan. Most importantly, we wanted to install an upstairs bathroom where the bedrooms are. We wanted our newly renovated house to fit into our neighborhood. We wanted a design that was compatible with the traditional New England aesthetic. We were eager to create a home that uses solar energy, epitomizes efficiency, and shows what can be done to improve an early 20th century house. Homes of this age make up a major part of Massachusetts housing stock and significant steps need to be taken to, to improve the efficiency of these homes to reach the state goals of being fossil fuel free. We are excited that our renovation might provide an example for other people to follow. And we were absolutely thrilled to be able to work with talented builder and architect, Jonathan and Frank. Frank will now share information about the design process. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Dill, principal of Frank Dill Architects in Belmont. I collaborated with Jonathan of Sage Builders on the project since schematic design. In addition to satisfying Woody and Marjorie's space needs that they talked about, our shared project goals included balancing energy use, embodied carbon, construction costs, and operational costs, electrification and fossil fuel elimination, uh, relatively simple construction techniques, and a focus on the air barrier. Next slide. This is the street view with the existing house on the left and the enlarged house under construction on the right. We increased the living area from three bedrooms and one bath to four bedrooms and two baths. Jonathan deserves the credit for the air barrier effectiveness, but we tried to make his life easier with simple massing, which is both less expensive to build and easier to insulate an air seal. Next slide. These photos are looking from the backyard, again, with the existing house on the left and the expanded house on the right. I prefer compact design solutions as the best way to save money reduce embodied carbon and reduce energy costs. I hit the limit of that strategy here. We investigated first floor options, which eliminated the one story kitchen addition, which is shown at lower left of both photos. But we found we could not meet uh, Woody and Marjorie's space needs with that smaller option. What the addition does provide is additional Southeast facing roof area for the PV array. And we also extended that roof somewhat for extra panels and rain protection over the back door. We liked that the PV panels could be installed in two simple rectangles, uninterrupted by plumbing vents, skylights, chimneys, dormers, and other typical Boston area roof detritus. Next slide. The property did not conform to current zoning requirements, 
and the minimum front and side yards for setbacks were our biggest challenge. Non-conforming areas are shown in red here. This informed our decision to renovate rather than tear down and rebuild, as a rebuilt structure would have to conform to these setbacks and would have occupied much more of the rear yard than the existing house. We had anticipated adding four inches of continuous insulation to all exterior walls, both existing and new. The town uh, allowed us to expand the existing house upward by adding the second floor and attic and backward by adding the rear addition, but increasing the wall thickness to be closer to the property lines became an issue for them. We explored several avenues for approval of this insulation and the setbacks, including finding zoning exceptions, uh, obtaining a variance, or getting a zoning amendment. But the uncertainty and that the inevitable delay uh, caused us to abandon those efforts. Instead, we devised the imperfect but expedient solution shown on the next slides. Next slide. This is a street view of the remodeled house showing our imperfect solution. So red areas are the non-conforming existing walls where we kept the existing stud walls already filled with dense back cellulose, roughly R14. Green areas are the new two by six stud walls set back an inch and a half from the face of the existing studs and again filled with dense back cellulose. To these, we applied two inches of insulated sheathing for a total of R29. Our original goal for these walls had been R40. The blue areas are conditioned basement walls where we added one inch of closed cell spray foam to the existing concrete walls and then added new two by four stud walls filled with dense back cellulose for a total of R19. Next slide. This is the side view of the house, very similar to the front, except we were able to set back the new two by six studs in the rear addition as well as the second story. Next slide. So this is the rear view of the remodeled house. The existing wall in red here actually conforms with the rear setback. So here we were, we were able to keep the existing stud walls filled with the cellulose, but we also added two inch uh, zip bar sheathing to there as well for a total of R24. The green areas are once again, new two by six walls, zip bar sheathing for a total of R29. Next slide. We were attracted to Huber's zip bar sheathing due to the speed of installing the air barrier, continuous insulation and sheathing in just one step. The engineer designed the sheathing to resist lateral wind loads, which required a one and a half inch penetration of nails into the studs or a three and a half inch long nail. During construction, however, we found that three and a quarter inch coil nails were the longest readily available length. So these were combined with the diagonal metal strap ties, which are shown here. Next slide. We looked at multiple window options and selected a high performance Alpen Zenith window in part to compensate for the underperforming walls. First and second floor windows are quadruple glazed with two layers of glass, two layers of suspended low E film and a Krypton fill. Because the basement was rest, less regularly occupied in condition, we opted for triple glazed windows there. Next slide. We were seeking relatively simple window installation details. And here we found a standard and inexpensive Alpen trim piece uh, with a nail fin. The frame extender allowed us to keep the weight of the window unit above the studs uh, while covering the increased thickness of the insulated sheathing. Next slide. We tried to reduce the embodied carbon in the design as much as possible by retaining a lot of the existing structure, uh, the concrete basement walls and slab, the existing exterior walls, two thirds of the first floor finishes and insulation, the stairs and air source heat pumps. We minimized the use of new concrete and structural steel and closed cell spray foam. We decided to support the rear addition on wood posts and concrete piers shown here, instead of a full height concrete foundation which reduced cost and the embodied carbon. And we love solutions like that. And we use carbon sequestering materials such as dense back cellulose insulation and wood framing as much as possible. Next slide. Our engineer specified 16 inch deep engineer joists for the new attic floor, which allowed us to do two things. One, span 24 feet between the existing walls and avoid overloading that uh, interior bearing wall and avoid adding new steel beams and columns, particularly down in the basement. The only exception and the only steel beam we used was in the existing garage where we needed more clearance uh, for the, an overhead garage door. Second, we were able to increase the 
attic floor insulation uh, to R68, uh, four inches of closed cell spray foam, um, and then 12 inches of dense back cellulose, which also helped us compensate for those underperforming walls. I'm now gonna turn the presentation over to Jonathan Cantor, who will explain the construction techniques, materials, and equipment in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take you through the construction process. Uh, here you see a, a view of the back on the left of the house um, with the uh, addition um, being temporarily supported. Um, and right after we started the demolition, we began to put up um, uh, this Henry Blue skin material, which provides a uh, weather resistant barrier, a vapor barrier, and an air barrier kind of all in one. Um, actually not a vapor barrier, it's vapor open, um, but it protects the um, dense pack cellulose that's in those behind that, those um, walls uh, so that it won't get wet. Um, and that, you know, during that demolition process, that's our biggest um, concern. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, actually, I, I just mentioned, so our target was a 0.6 ACH50, which is, is of course the passive house standard. Um, and um, we were already, you know, throughout this project, we were already planning on how we would do that. And part of it, of course, as Frank mentioned, was uh, deciding to use the zip R sheathing, which turned out to be really easy to use. Uh, this was our framing crew. Um, building the walls and raising them right here. And they had never used the zip bar sheathing before, had absolutely no problems doing so. Um, they do of course use the standard three and a quarter inch framing nails uh, that come in a coil for their guns. Um, the three and a half inch isn't really available. I don't even know if their guns um, could accommodate that size. Um, <clears throat> But as Frank mentioned, we uh, reinforced the corners with um, cross with the metal strapping. Um, you can see here as they're lifting this wall uh, that they allow the, um, the R sheathing to extend beyond the wall plate so that it provides coverage, continuous coverage over the uh, rim joist around the uh, uh, attic floor uh, joist system. Um, really a very effective strategy. And once that's all taped up, of course, we have a really robust air barrier. Um, and here you see uh, all the different layers. We got our blue Henry's uh, blue skin on the um, bottom, the existing walls that we um, just covered the existing sheathing. It gets um, taped and or sticks to the zip sheathing. And then of course, all the zip panels are taped together with the zip tape. and um, you know, we before we put the roof on, we taped that that exposed outside corner um, so that the deck of the attic floor becomes part of the air barrier as well. Um, really, uh, really simple to do um, and very effective. And here you can see where we've got some pictures of uh, preparing the windows and doors. Uh, we tape the insides um, with a, a tape that. Uh, is, is double-sided and it allows us to stick it on the door on one side. And then after it's installed, we can fold the tape over and install it and adhere it directly to the wood studs on the inside. And then of course, on the outside, we tape it as well. Um, really was easy to do. Um, we taught the framers how to do it so they could install the windows and doors and um, worked really well. Um, and then of course we just put the siding on right over it. Uh, we encased all the windows first and taped them. Um, and then uh, um, we did use uh, hydro gap um, to provide a, a little bit of a, a, a rain screen, uh, a little create those little blue um, like sausage size uh, dimples um, provide a, a three dimensional aspect that allow um, water, pretty much water vapor to easily migrate out of the wall system. Uh, on the inside, we also spent a, a significant effort on air sealing. Um, we used the Intello smart membrane 
um, both on the walls and the ceiling. Uh, we put it on the ceiling first and then strapped it with two buys uh, in an effort to really minimize uh, ceiling penetrations up into that attic floor um, assembly. Uh, what I didn't anticipate and didn't appreciate at the time was how many holes we'd end up putting in these walls after we put the Intello in place. Um, we really went to significant effort. We, we used acoustic sealant to glue the, um, the, the barrier down to the floor. Uh, we taped all the joints. Um, but then, and I'll show you in this next slide here, when the insulation guys came through, they decided they needed to uh, make all of these holes in order to um, fill these cavities with benzopack cellulose. Um, so we, of course, went right behind them and started taping everything like crazy. They also decided that they needed to make these, um, each um, bay um, that's covered with the Intello membrane um, really taut uh, so that the cellulose wouldn't bulge out much and um, have be difficult for the plasterers to work with. So. Um, they decided they had to side nail all of our um, air barrier, which created little rips and tears. So we ended up having to tape all the, the vertical joints as well. Now, in hindsight, I probably would have spray used um, a wet spray cellulose to fill all these cavities first and then applied the air barrier second. Um, and I also probably would have tested with the blower door uh, at each stage to see what the additional, the marginal impact was of our additional efforts. Um, but per usual, we were so rushed in trying to keep up with everybody that um, we didn't have the luxury of that time to do the proper testing and uh, uh, lesson learned. Um, but anyways, it did work out well. We reduced our air infiltration from 2400 CFM 50 before we started the project down to um, uh, about 200, about 198, just under 200, which is a 0.7 ACH 50. Uh, we were going for 140 and, and uh, we still don't know why we didn't get there, but um, we, have, we have some guesses, but um, we never went back to really um, try to figure out exactly where it was leaking from because when you get such low air leakage, it's pretty hard to tell uh, where it's coming from. Let me go to the next slide. Um, we did use a, a major wet wall here for most all of our piping, uh, including our balanced air system. So we did use a Zender uh, ERV to provide continuous balanced ventilation. It exchanges um, stale exhaust air from inside the house with fresh air from outside. And in the process, it, it, um, it recoups about 80, 80 to 90% of the energy that is already put into our exhaust air stream and uh, takes that energy and, and reintroduces it into the fresh air. So it's a very efficient way to ventilate a house. And when you are building tight, um, you have to really ventilate it right. And so this is the best way to do it. Um, we did use uh, mini split heat pumps, um, two on the first floor, uh, one on the second floor and one on in the basement uh, to heat and cool the house. We used um, a couple of little um, uh, transfer fans to circulate some of that air. Uh, and we're still trying to work out the details on how to um, make that uh, really meet a sufficient level of comfort. So that's something that still needs uh, practice with. And, uh, you know, the house worked out great. The solar um, so far appears to be more than offsetting our energy needs. We'll see what happens after this coming winter. Um, but we're built, the, um, the homeowners, Marjorie and Woody, are um, operating the house very well, um, efficiently, and uh, they are building up a nice little credit so that when winter comes, they can pay for their, their additional heating costs. Uh, and that's our story. Um, 
I would add that this was a perfect house for this process. And I think it can be duplicated in many, many other uh, instances. Um, and I hope people will find this a very helpful presentation. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you all very, very much. This was so exciting. I feel like I have to renovate my own home now um, with, with good builders, of course. Uh, but I, I, I had a couple of questions and then we'll see if the audience has some questions. But as someone who has been uh, uh, passionate about the issue of um, embodied carbon since the 80s, I was curious when each of you uh, heard the term or recognized the term and for, for the design and construction teams, when did you start to in, incorporate it into your thinking? Uh, I'm just wondering about the cycle, the cyclical changes and, and how we can now build on that to exacerbate it. So when when did that first become part of your thinking? Jonathan, you're up, so you want to go first? Sure. Um, I would say, uh, I think it was a NESI conference, um, the, the Building Energy Conference, um, either two or three years ago, I forget, um, where there was this sort of initial focus on embodied carbon. And uh, that's when it really hit home to me that the embodied carbon was really the uh, you know sleeping monster that we had to really focus on that if we were going to um, have any chance of dealing with climate change, and so basically from then on I tried to stop using foam and reusing as much existing buildings as we can, um, and then you know making improvements that are easy that require less resources to do uh, if you can, you know, if you have that opportunity and certainly making that point to clients and, and everyone that I work with. Well, then I just want to call a special shout out to Rachel, who's the chair of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association board and um, to thank her for the work that Nessie's doing. But Rachel, when did you start hearing, uh, thinking about embodied carbon? I think it was um, around the same time, possibly a little earlier than the building energy conference that Jonathan's talking about, but that was the one where the, the I think the keynotes right. session was on carbon drawdown now with Ace McCarlton and Chris Magwood and Jacob Rickusen was um, a wake up call uh, and the, uh, for all of us. Um, interestingly, um, and Kathy doesn't know this because we've probably didn't talk that much about it, but this was um, our first attempt to um, in and at, you know, our typical approach up until this project had been, if you um, are gonna put the thermal boundary at the roof line and you're, you're not replacing the roof, right? This roof was actually fairly new. You just spray foam the underside of the, the roof. And this was our first attempt to, to think through an alternative to that. Um, and we, we looked at several options. I don't think we ever talked about it in terms of embodied carbon, but that's why we, we landed on the strategy that we did, which is obviously not as good as just if you had just done cellulose, but it's certainly better than it would have been if we had done all spray foam. Woody, I think you used the term embodied uh, carbon. Wind, and, and I asked the same thing for Kathy, when did you, was that part of your, uh, aside from the common sense of reuse what already exists, when did the whole idea that new materials have a climate impact, uh, was, it, was that just a natural part of your thinking? Is that because we, we bring our own grocery bags? I mean, what, what, where did it, where did it enter into your, your, your mindset? Or well, when? I think I'd heard, first heard the term embodied carbon around two years ago, but really it just made a lot of sense to both Marjorie and me to reuse the, as much of the existing house as we could. Um, and so we were happy to find Jonathan and Frank who understood that concept. And uh, Jonathan is very strongly committed to minimizing his, uh, the embodied carbon. And 
And Kathy, your house is a little bit more unique. It's almost a heritage, a family heirloom. But but did that whole idea of of this the environmental sense of reusing what you already have come into play, or was it more about um, negotiating how to make an heirloom more livable? I think probably the um, we the best part about working with Bigemeister is they really educated us along the way. We had never done any kind of major project on the house and so didn't know we had all these options of different things to do. So we came in very naive in terms of um, the choices that we had, um, but as we went along with their process, I felt like we were able to make those choices that made more environmental sense. Kathy, did you get your office? I'm not sure I heard no, that. No, I didn't. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Well, so there's there's still another phase, right? This is sure. this is, uh, but you got a great kitchen, obviously. Well, <laughs> so. the whole the whole first floor is transformed, so it's really yeah. changed how we live. Well, so. we'll we'll keep rooting for the office. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat, um, and so let's turn to those. There's a question about would spray applied fiberglass. Um, JM Spider have worked better than the cellulose. Uh, doesn't require the netting. I think you you both teams use cellulose. Do you want to speak to the alternatives in terms of of uh, other types of insulation? Sure. I think I mentioned in my presentation um, that I probably would do it again with um, a wet sprayed cellulose, but um, I had have not familiar with the Spider product. Um, but that may well be another uh, good product to try. Uh, of course, with the cellulose, you get a, a product that actually, um, it, I guess, is considered an absorbing carbon material. So it offsets. Um, I'm not sure whether the fiberglass gives you that same negative aspect. I don't believe it does, Jonathan. I was, that was the piece I was going to add to what you yeah. said. And the, the other question is about the return on investment on the solar panels. Do you know, uh, does Woody and, and, uh, and Kath, do you, do, you, do you know the turn on on that, Jonathan, or, or whoever, I'm blanking on, I'm mucking my names up. What was the return on investment on the photovoltaics? Do you know, in terms of carbon? The, oops. The solar company said that it would pay for itself within five years. Uh, that's in terms of dollars, I don't know about it in um, carbon. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, since the solar panels were turned on in March, we have generated a roughly a $1,500 credit, which we will be using through the winter when we have less solar um, power produced but I'm pretty sure we're going to come out net zero. Jonathan, do you know the answer to the carbon? No, I, unfortunately, I don't know that. Um, I have to consult with uh, Rachel about how to do that calculation. Yeah, I, was uh, I, I mean, I'm sure, you know, in, in some respects, um, we don't have a better solution. Um, we don't, um, we know that fossil fuels is not an option, so um, we have to look towards other ways to supply our energy needs. Um, solar, I know these panels will be there for 30 years unless there's a new technology that makes them so obsolete that it's worth changing. So I, you know, I haven't done the, the carbon calculus, but I'm sure it's positive over that term, and I'm sure that this is a much better approach than trying to do the same renovation but use something that has fossil fuels. Rachel, yeah, do, agreed. Do, do you know this, the payback in this region? Well, you know, so I, so this is going to get a little wonky, but I, I would usually um, use the grid factor for it, um, for emissions, because you, in other words, you associate you ascribe the the um, the carbon savings to the grid rather than to the individual house, because it's a grid tied system. I assume that it's yeah. getting SREX and all that. So, I, <laughs> so I would I would I would look at it at a different scale, I guess. But I absolutely agree with Jonathan that you know 
electrification plus decarbonization of our, you know, everybody here knows that, right? We gotta reduce the energy we use, electrify the end uses of energy and decarbonize our electricity supply. Well, and I would add actually that something that's called the time value of carbon, which is that that if if you think of a graph, if it's going from where we are now in a in a heavy emissions world straight down to net zero for the whole world, that's really good. Except that what's even better is if we can drive the carbon emissions down more quickly, and actually even if they level out. Uh, towards the net zero, everything that's between one curve and the straight line is a carbon savings, you know, is an emissions savings. So, so the, the important point about reusing buildings is that they actually, we, we believe from the documentation that's being done with more and more data, that the amount of, of, of emissions released in order to renovate a building uh, as opposed to building new uh, usually pays back within uh, two to five years in terms of reduction also of emissions. And that quick rapid drive is really what the time value of carbon is all about. Um, and we, in our projects, even in large projects, we like, like, like Big Master, like Rachel and Jonathan, we're seeing that carbon payback easily within the 10 year window. Um, and so by the time 10 years have come, uh, the, the, the lines of carbon spent in the renovation versus carbon saved uh, have crossed. And so I think I'd, I'd, there is a question about asking uh, to share square footage uh, costs and I'll, I'll let you think about that and decide if you wanna do it. But I would also like for this group, tell me what you think would be the single biggest policy change that could really uh, expedite the what you these two projects have done because this is absolutely what needs to happen in order to save the planet uh, to to reuse what we already have in such smart and beautiful ways that would just that would make a huge difference in our 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 national uh, carbon emissions. Is there is there one thing you would like your planning board or your building code to embrace that would have made this more of a slam dunk other than your own high moral sense? Just one. I just want one idea. I'll Does start. I'll start. I'll start. I'll start. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what it, how, how this, um, what exactly the specifics of this be, but I do think that um, incorporating embodied carbon considerations both into zoning and into code, and I know they're, you know, they're, we're moving in that, in that direction, surely, um, is, um, is really critical. Um, you know, the fact that that's happening, that that needs to happen on a sort of local, you know, municipality by municipality, jurisdiction by jurisdiction means that it's not moving, you know, as fast as it as it needs to when you so when you ask Jean, is there one policy that's like the one downside, I think it's it's sort of an upside and a downside. It's not moving fast enough. Um, but I do think it's critical. Rachel, could you uh, mention the MVP programs role um, in in our renovation? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Bill. So um, so the um, incentive programs um, where they exist can um, be a huge driver of, um, of decarbonization. So the MVP program that Bill just mentioned, the home MVP pilot uh, was an efficiency program that the um, Department of Energy Resources ran for, I think it was three years, Jonathan, maybe you remember, it was either two or three years um, that was to, I, I think the intention was to sort of test out some possible ways to improve mass save. Um, but the fact of that program was extraordinary incentives for conversions to heat pumps so along with other measures. Um, and that's really what enabled Kathy and Chris to undertake the whole house conversion. I mean, we looked at, we priced um, a gas boiler with um, no additional whole house AC alongside the heat pumps and the fact that the incentives exist, uh, ex that the incentives existed and that they were so extraordinarily generous made the conversion possible. 
And that's, um, a, that, that's a state program, Rachel? That is no longer in existence. It was well, a pilot program. But, well, there's a sequel to it that is, um, that, that uh, I think we took advantage of. You're talking that, about RNA, Mass Save RNA? Yeah, the remodel and new- Renovations and additions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't know if it was exactly as, as no. uh, helpful, but um, it does do, it, it does provide um, um, overall energy performance um, improvement rebates, you know, so it's tied to how well you do. And certainly that encourages better air barriers, which I think are probably critical. I think um, two, two other comments I would make. One, um, in terms of codes, the embodied carbon issue is very, very complicated. Um, and I think it's gonna take some time to sort out uh, and I wouldn't be holding my breath on it at the residential level. Um, I think at the um, multifamily and larger commercial uh, scale, Newton is already working on uh, a special permit provision that would require um, a, a lot of analysis. I don't know that we've figured out exactly what the standard is for a code um, but that that's you know a much more timely um, endeavor. And then the uh, you're back to your discussion about um, solar PV and when does it become sort of obsolete from an embodied carbon standpoint? Um, you know, when the grid becomes 100% renewable or very close to that, then we might look at whether it's worth investing in solar on one's house when you can just get, you know, energy from the grid that's 100% renewable. But, you know, we're, we're probably pretty far away from that point. And then if 10 years is our critical limit, I think we have to uh, move to solar PV as wherever we can. That's a very good point. There was a study done by uh, MIT four or five years ago that enraged some of the people in the net zero community because it said that the most effective way to use photovoltaics was in large scale uh, solar farms. And uh, since uh, uh, many people have been driving for photovoltaics on houses, that wasn't what they wanted to hear. Uh, but I agree with you with, since we are a long way from having full scale electric, green electric, we put it wherever we can and, uh, and and go from there. So uh, let's see other questions. Um, uh, so does anybody want to share cost? I, I think that's a homeowner question myself, but I'll, I'll uh, so I'll, I'll just say it's ask and I, it's up to you. I honestly, honestly, I haven't analyzed it. So I can't, I can't say for sure. I would like to at some point analyze our costs. Um, and particularly on, on various components and assemblies. I, I think for us, you know, one of the challenge, well, the house had never been renovated. We also didn't own the house when we first moved in. And so literally the house was gifted to us. So we felt like we were buying our first house with the renovation. So I think what going through the process that Bigemeister has, um, it's kind of like it, all the costs made sense to us and they were very, good about anticipating the costs. And so I felt like we were on budget and that was really important to us as a homeowner. And I don't have the cost broken down by, by square foot either. Um, we don't actually, I don't know if Jonathan, if you do that typically for renovation projects, but we don't typically do that. Um, look at costs on a square foot basis. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't find square foot costs helpful. Um, on, on certain assemblies and components, it's helpful. Right. And, and then in today's market, you can't, you can't cost anything on a square foot basis, even an assembly. It just, uh, the numbers are just all over the place right now. I may have missed this, but when did these projects happen? Ours was 2019. Yeah, and just enrolled into the beginning of 2020. 
So you made it wonderful for Kathy's family right before she had to go, but she still didn't get her office. And right before she had to start working. Gene, you first, need to start you know. harping on that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, um, they they finished. I think finished at the end of January, and within six weeks, um, we had both kids home living with us back. You know, who'd been at college and other things and no furniture for the first floor because all our stuff was in storage and you couldn't get someone to move at the beginning of the pandemic, no one was moving anything. So we lived very minimally for that first uh, part of COVID. Mm. Woody and, and uh, Marjorie, when was yours project? Ours was done in during COVID actually. Oh. Um, just <laughs> there you know. Um, Jonathan, I don't even remember when we started it, but we finished it in, uh, well, we're still working on some things as Jonathan said, we finished it about two months ago. So we also put our stuff in storage and, um, and are still opening boxes and reorganizing and, and learning about our house and loving it. Construction started in oh. uh, July of 2020. That's right. So just a little under a year. It's very kind of you uh, to share with us while you're still in the midst of uh, re-entry into the, into the world of comfort and living. <laughs> but but, um, but Margot actually was just asking, uh, Margot Jones was asking the question about about the costs and just wanting to know perhaps in, Kathy, you've said that the renovation was a bit like buying a new house, um, but, but that was a wash because you'd been gifted. Um, for, for Woody and Marjorie, was, was the renovation, did you price out? Would it, would it have been less expensive to tear the house down and start over? Or did you look at those as a cost comparison? Well, um in talking with Jonathan um, originally at the very, very beginning, um, it would have been most likely less expensive to tear it down um, than to do what we did with it. But it just rubbed us the wrong way. I couldn't imagine taking our beautiful little cape and throwing it into the dump. It was against all of our values, so. Oh, thank um, you. I am so grateful that you feel that way. Yeah, actually, actually, I'll add to that. I think, I, I actually think um, what we actually built was less expensive than building it from scratch. Um, and the, the reason is, is because we basically used techniques that you would use for new construction um, to renovate the majority of the house. You know, building the second floor was new construction. And so the, the crews that I used who are used to doing new construction were still in their element and could still perform in a very efficient way and only um, required you know, small modifications um, at existing situations. So you know, we didn't have to rebuild the foundation. We didn't have to do any extensive um, excavation work. We didn't have to do any new uh, water and sewer connections. So, you know, it didn't get those improvements, of course, but at the same time, those were costs that, that we didn't have to incur. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's probably cheaper. Uh, I, I mean, it's probably, this was probably a cheaper option. And, um, you know, I, that's why I think that square foot costs are really hard to understand because it really depends on what your finishes are and you know, what kind of efforts you make in the air barrier, for example, and, or you know, what kind of HVAC system you put in. Uh, those are gonna be much more a determinant of what the costs are. And so you know, unless you're comparing absolute apples to apples, um, it's, I think it's hard to know what the difference is. That's a really good point, Jonathan, thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions, and uh, but I wondered if the if the speakers, having listened to each other and to the conversation, have any final comments or questions. 
Um, should we perhaps, would you mind if we just went in the order that you originally presented and uh, you get your last say here on the recorded statement that lasts forever. So uh, think, think what your final brilliance is. This is, we can do this like PBS, you know, your moment of brilliance here as, uh, as you speak. So I think Rachel, that means it turns to you, then Kathy, then Bill, and then uh, to the SAGE team, okay? So am I asking a question or am I just summing up some final you may, words? You may, whichever. Okay. I worded that so in such a confused manner that you may <laughs> use this moment however you would like. <laughs> um, well, the fact that, so I just have to preface this by saying the fact that Jean asked me a question about the, the carbon payback of the measures we did meant that I spent most of my time during while Jonathan and Frank um, and, <laughs> and Woody and Marjorie were speaking, finding the answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So if, although I've heard their presentation before, I don't have a question for them at my fingertips. So maybe maybe Bill or Kathy does. But I will just say, um, I guess publicly, thank you to Kathy. Um, this was when we um, went around at our annual meeting after that year, and we talked about what our favorite project was. I said that yours was my favorite project of the year. And um, the reason it was is because the house um, meant so much to you. Um, Bill and I have talked about how, and to Chris, how, you know, there's always, when you're renovating an existing home and Marjorie and Woody, maybe you felt this way too, that there's an incredible emotional attachment to the house, but this was magnified. Um, and so navigating that, and also the fact that what you said, you put so much trust in us to sort of help you make the decisions. And we ended up um, doing a lot of energy upgrades and the conversion to the heat pumps that I know you weren't, um, you didn't necessarily set out to do. So, um, and I'm also very glad when we were preparing for this that you said the house is so much more comfortable now and that you weren't actually expecting that. You know, a lot of people who haven't kind of aren't in our world don't understand the comfort benefits that come from um, these envelope improvements. So anyway, so um, I don't know if I'm, if I'm not really following my assignment the way I'm supposed to, Jean, but I just wanted to say thank you to Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. I, I would really just encourage you know, architects, builders, to really educate people about, I think now um, uh, with the knowledge that everyone's having about climate change and what we absolutely must do, that people might be willing, if they have the knowledge, to make different choices that might be more expensive, but in the end aren't expensive because it does help you save costs and the planet down the road. So um, many people aren't aware of those. And I think that that's, we learned a lot and I'm really glad that we stretched our budget to take care of those things. In the house, I can go up in the attic now. I don't have to look at the weather and decide like, oh, next month I'll go up to get something because it's so hot or so cold. So it's really made a, a huge difference, you know, and I can be in all parts of the house um, in the winter and it's so much more toasty than it was um, before. So it's made a difference. And I'll just echo Rachel again that this this was a, a favorite project of the year. I mean, it's all, often we only get to, I only feel like I get to sort of experience the benefits of the end result of our work um, on like a punch list walkthrough, maybe when you go back to photograph it, but uh, to get to see it in this level and in this in-depth study of uh, the energy benefits of what we did, um, you know, I, I think, uh, and plus the meaning of, of the house. Um, but I'll quote uh, Big Meister's founder, Paul Eldrenkamp, who uh, once wrote that what we do when all things go well is we help good people. Like that's just that's just what we do, you know? And, and, and I think that this is really a, an example of that. Um, that's been so so rewarding and satisfying to know that uh, we've, we've impacted the, the history of this family in this house, so. Jonathan, do you want to lead for your team? Um, sure. Um, uh, I would I would also thank our homeowners, Woody and Marjorie, who were just an absolute pleasure to work with. And, um, you know, it, it uh, again, allowed me to do things that I love to do, which was really terrific. And I think Frank had a good time uh, along with us. Um, so it's always super when you have a great team and, and, you know, this is certainly one of our favorite projects. Um, 
a couple of um, more specific questions for the Big Meister team um, is, uh, why didn't you go for a higher R value on your, in your attic roof? Um, and the other question um, is, why didn't you use a heat pump dryer and get rid of the gas altogether? Um, I don't know if the getting rid of the dryer would have, Kathy would have fired us. I mean, we were, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've heard of folks, um, you know, who love their gas cooking for some reason, but um, uh, it just wasn't, onto a dryer. I just didn't want to one. buy, I didn't want to buy another appliance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it's one of those, like, it was not part of the project and it, when it dies, she will replace it. She will get rid of her last gas appliance. So that one was an easy one. And then the first question was about the R value of the roof and why we didn't like build it down more. Yeah. Um, if you're going through that effort, I mean, R forties is not even code. Well, it was. I think it was R forty nine. Yeah. We. But basically, we needed to keep some headroom for storage. I mean, that was we. We tried to take the. Um, we tried to eliminate that that as storage space, and we were we were rebuffed. <laughs> I mean, these old colonials have no closet space, so it's you know, um, it, we still needed the attic for. for it's some. a good it's a good question though, Jonathan. We could have probably built it down a couple more inches, and maybe they would have been stooping a little like this, but it wouldn't it would have still been usable. So. Marjorie and Woody, do you have any comments or questions? Oh, do you want to ask Frank? Do you want to go first, or should we go? Oops. Okay, we can go. Um, one of the things that we wish we had been able to do was add continuous insulation on the outside of the house, but the zoning restrictions prevented that. And I believe the town of Arlington has revisited that. It may be permissible now to add exterior insulation and encroach more on your uh, setbacks. Um, and I'd also like to thank everybody for the opportunity of letting us share our house with you. And also just say we had a great team uh, with Frank and Jonathan. And I wanna to add to the um, great team. I felt extremely fortunate to um, be educated by both Jonathan and Frank around the needs. I was one of those people that grew up in New England and was really attached to my wood fireplace. Um, we grew up splitting wood ourselves. And um, so it, it was a real pull for me to give up that fireplace. And I don't think that I really understood how much that would cause um, leaks in our house. And so just through some kind education, I came completely around. And right now I'm so happy not to have that fireplace. So I just, I think somebody said this kind of education um, to homeowners and to, to towns is so critical. And I um, wanna echo that. Frank, you get the sure. last word. I, <laughs> I just wanted to follow up about uh, my experience with the town also and that they were uh, very concerned with sort of the precedents that had been set and fairness and what the state attorney general thought and all these rules and regulations that I, I just wish uh, addressing climate change seemed to be really far down on their priority list. And I, I just wish that were otherwise and that that could sort of somehow be moved up that uh, that anything like this that we wanted to do if it's put air source heat pump outdoor units in the setbacks or put insulation in the setbacks. I just wish that were a lot easier. And I know some towns have addressed that. Um, I, I wish they all would uh, soon. Well, it sounds like your project may have actually allowed for exterior insulation, which is something that I've had many, many, many a fight with over with historic commissions, actually. Um, 
And I, so I just feel like with each of these extraordinary projects and with people like you, uh, this is each one has a pebble in the pool and it'll set, start sending the ripples out, but it's going to be, it's about advocacy and, and where we are in our own communities and working for change. So thank you all so much. It's been so inspiring to see this wonderful projects and to hear the good work that you're doing. Uh, and we'll look, I'll look forward to seeing the, the uh, I don't see if there are any, I think just there's a general thank you from Caitlin, who is called BSA Space to thank all of you. And uh, I think I'd like to thank our sponsors and our affiliates again. I believe Caitlin, you give me some slides for that, right? Or do I have to do it on my own? I'm, I'm slow, but almost there. Thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I would remember, of course, to thank the Spalding Brick Company. We really do appreciate you making this possible. And I think the quality of these presentations has more than uh, substantiated, I hope, your, your commitment to sponsoring. And thank you again. And then to the many affiliates that we have, uh, this, this has been, we're really trying hard to expand the conversation. And it looks to me like we probably may need to, Rachel, have conversations with Nessie to make sure that Nessie is one of our partners here. Here, but AIA Connecticut chapters, uh, uh, Vermont, New England, Western Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and the Boston Preservation Alliance, who we many of us have worked with for a long time in the advocacy for existing buildings, and for um, uh, IFMA, and for Building Energy Plus, uh, who was formerly known as the uh, USGB, the Green Building Chapter in Massachusetts. So thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Caitlin, uh, for helping put this together. We really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.